Hey, hello, and welcome to another episode of Someone Else that Mike Barron has blackmail material on. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we we have some blackmail material on each other. I was going to say, I was going to say, that might day. go both ways. Oh, yeah, absolutely right. Thank you guys for inviting me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, Dean and I worked together on Hawk and Dove for DC, and uh, Dean's been a master illustrator for many years. Uh, and he's gone independent in the last couple of years through his own Silverline comics. Uh, but Dean, let's get into uh, the beginning. How did you break into comics? Well, at the time, I, uh, I was working in advertising in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I was working for a small creative department for a huge department store named Macy's. And they had a store there at the time. And we were uh, be, being low man on the totem pole there, just hired. I was one of the crew uh, asked to do uh, inventory. And back in those days, that meant staying up till midnight and counting merch, right? So we're uh, we're in the downtown uh, area mall there. I think it was in Buckhead. And uh, we're counting inventory for Macy's. And I walk by a Walden Books, I think it was. And I see, I see one of those turnstiles, a spinner rack. And I see a comic book cover. And it was, it was just not that great. You know, the, the drawing wasn't that great. So, you know, this little voice, it's like, I can do better than that. And then I heard another voice say, well, why don't you prove it then? So from that point on, I sort of went, I've got to prove that I can draw better than some of these guys getting hired to draw comics. So there was a resource book at the time uh, called The Artist's Market. I don't know if you remember that, but it was a, sort of a guidebook on how to promote your art, how to, how to get work. Uh, commercially, whether it was fine art or commercial. I mean, I was I was an illustrator at the time, just getting work wherever I could. Um, so I started submitting and, uh, you know, I got the typical rejection letters. You need to work on this. You need to work on that. Um, <clears throat> so time passed and uh, I'm in a uh, copy store and I'm, I'm making copies to submit. And a gentleman by the name of Roland Mann walks into the copier store. And uh, I don't believe this is by accident, by any means. He looks over and he says, hey, uh, did you draw those pages? Yeah. Well, what are you going to use them for? And I'm submitting. I'm trying to get work. Where are you sending them to? Oh, Marvel, DC, you know, the usual. And he goes, well, I, I actually just got hired by a small company out in, uh, in Malibu as an editor. I said, you're kidding. No, no. He said, uh, uh, can I uh, take these with them? I'm like, sure. Here, take a couple of stacks of these things. So anyway. Long story short, too late. Um, he uh, he gave me the opportunity to draw my first full color superhero comic called The Ferret way back in the early 90s. I think it was 93. And uh, it has the unique uh, quality of having the very first die cut cover for Ferret number one. Uh, and uh, it just started from there. That led to me getting other work, uh, you know, going to shows helped, of course, uh, going to San Diego and, and networking. Those days was a lot different. It really was, you know, <laughs> it was it was who you knew and who, who liked you and who you talked to and, and all of that. So that's how it started in the early 90s. And Roland, if you're listening to this, he wants to do another die cut cover really badly. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah. we'll just get a, a cookie cutter and sharpen the edges and we'll yeah. use that. Nice. Nice sharp exacto will take care of that. Another foil cover, perhaps, an embossed cover. I no, I joke with them all the time. I want to do a spot varnish embossed <laughs> you know, foil. Anyway. So yeah. uh, we we've we've uh, we've reconnected, you know, fast forward from those those uh, madcap days in the nineties and uh, about six years ago. We reconnected via, I think it was Facebook, and I said, you know, what are you doing? And he talked about, you know, well, I, I looked into getting some work for uh, one of the big two again, but yeah, it just wasn't going to work out. They, they wanted me to move out to Burbank, and they weren't paying me, you know, anything. And, and I said, well, are you going to start back up? He said, I'm thinking about it. And uh, I said, well, what, what, what are you thinking about? And we talked about Silverline, which is a small uh, publishing venture he had started in the in the late 80s and uh, he had a book called Cat and Mouse 
we talked about it. We came up with the idea of me drawing issue number one and uh, one thing led to another. And, you know, he decided, well, let me, let me start this up again. So it's been going for about six years. We've got about 30 titles. There's a lot of folks there from the Malibu days and, and, and a lot of veterans there from, uh, you know, from the nineties who are still working and then some new folks too, that, uh, Roland taught in, um, in school. Uh, he sees actually teaching sequential art as well as writing some of the comics. So, uh, yeah, that led me to get back into the industry, keep getting pulled back in, you know, like Pacino. Uh, yeah. but it's, it's, it's fun. It, it, I, I couldn't, I never really stopped doing it. It was one of those things where, uh, you know, I, I had to, I had to get a regular paycheck and things like insurance and, you know, maybe some retirement. So it was like, I had to get what you'd call a real day job in the early 2000s. Uh, and uh, I've stuck with that for almost 20 years now, uh, working for uh, for FedEx by day, comics by night. Uh, I do I actually draw airplane parts for them, you know, for their pilot oh, cool. school. So that's kind of the day gig. And then still do this when I can, nights and weekends, much to my wife's chagrin. And uh, are you still drawing? Yes, I've done that. So, uh, but no, she's very supportive. I joke around. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, I'm still doing this stuff. Um, and like Mike said, he and I, he and I worked on Hawk and Dove back in the nineties. And then we actually pitched some stuff to Marvel. You remember that about 10 years ago, Mike, we pitched some stuff to Marvel and DC. And this was the beginning of them sort of going, ah, you guys are too old. We didn't, nah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We weren't cool anymore. So. Like, okay, we'll just take our stuff and do our own stuff, which, you know, nowadays with the internet as your distribution and so on and so forth, it's, it's more viable to go that route and actually cooler because we're, we're the gatekeepers in a way, you know, we just, we go directly to the audience now. So, you know, it's no longer, you know, some editor who decides whether you're going to get work or not. It's, it's more, you know, do your own thing and the audience decides. So... Yeah. So speaking of Marvel, um, and I know this is backtracking a little bit. Yeah. Were, yeah. You, were you there when uh, when Marvel bought Malibu? <laughs> I uh, I'm wondering what that was like. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a lot of politics and a lot of gossip and a lot of turbulence. Yeah. Uh, the long story short was both DC and Marvel were interested in Malibu. Yeah, and that's right. Um, they were both negotiating, you know, behind the scenes and all the suits were having their talks and, you know, flexing their muscles and so on. And, and the way, the way Roland tells it, he was actually privy to a lot of these backroom conversations. I get it secondhand, right. but he said basically that, uh, <laughs> Marvel bought Marvel. I mean, Marvel bought Malibu basically as a color house, right. yeah. uh, to prevent DC from buying it. So it was an ego face. Oh, no, 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 you're not going to get we're going to get it. Right. So the assumption was, oh, cool. You know, we'll be crossing over. It'll be like Ferret and Wolverine or, you know, yeah, yeah. Nightman and Prime. Man, oh, it's cool. No, never happened. You know, so, uh, you know, lawyers got involved and mayhem ensued. And so I don't think we're, you're ever going to see marvel with malibu characters you know which is kind of sad they but. never did anything with those characters did they no they didn't yeah. um it had to do with the ownership of a gentleman who should rename uh, remain nameless at this yeah. point that uh you know would would really charge a whole lot of money if that was to happen and they were like nah we'll just make up new stuff so well, yeah. they've been kind of doing that with the cross gen stuff too that yeah. they bought up yep i yep. mean it's it's what the big corporations do. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's, you know, you guys could talk more about, you know, how, how corporate has just altered the landscape uh, forever uh, in terms of that. But uh, I think there's just so much more freedom now to do what we want to do than there was. I mean, yeah, I was like any other guy trying to break in. You know, I was, oh, man, it would be so cool to draw Batman. So I did. Right. And, oh, it's so cool to draw, you know, Green Lantern. I did. You know, it's so cool to draw Wonder Woman. I did. You know, and it's like, okay, but ultimately, 
you're still playing in someone else's sandbox, right? It would still be cool to draw Nexus, but you know, that's a yeah. conversation. Well, we can yeah. talk about but, that, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to talk about that. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, now here we are. And I mean, the fact that I can, you know, write on my own character and have the excitement there. And also a lot of the generation that was brought up aspiring to draw these legacy classic characters they're they're they've grown out of it and the the new up and coming readership is kind of like yeah they're cool what else you got yeah you know it doesn't really have that imprimatur of like you've made it as it did you know back in the day um it it still earns you a level of street cred so to speak to have done those legacy characters but in the end you know that's all it is it's just like hey you know i used to play for the cowboys okay what are you doing now yeah so, yeah you know it yeah. is what it is uh, how, how do you feel about like um kind of like anagram characters or whatever where you kind of loosely base it on that but you're like i want to put my own spin on it I mean, I'm not going to diss people who want to do that, you know, Um, but hey, you know, it's a wide open field. Do something completely out of left field. I mean, Mike, Mike is the master of that. Yeah. Um, Just, I mean, the, the, just uh, the, the variance of characters that Mike came up with for those, those rollicking Nexus adventures where you were just like, what you know but it, that, that was the fun of it you had no idea of the, the alien you were going to meet and the settings the environments you know where the twists and turns would take you there's something just there's something compelling about that that's just beyond the okay i'm going to make up another version of, of batman i'm going to make up yeah. another version of spider-man and all. that's cool i mean if that's really what you want to do but man you you've just got this whole world to, to go you know do something really cool uh, the other, you know, I, I ask, well, I'm asked, I should say from artists a lot, you know, you know, do you draw like this guy or that guy? I want to draw like this one, draw like that. A lot of, a lot of young people are starting out copying, um, anime, you know? Yeah. And I tell them, look, you know, I start out copying my heroes, you know, you start out copying what you just, but draw from life, learn, learn from what you're drawing from. But in the end draw like who you are and make it make it you uh because that's what people are going to connect with it's got to be genuine whether you're writing or drawing you got to feel that genuine connection with what you're doing um i remember showing my portfolio to neil adams um and boy boy was that like you know a tough football coach right (laughs) um and you know I was talking about style and he goes, you still got a lot of work to do before, you know, you worry about losing your style. He's like, you gotta, you gotta practice more. He's like, he use photography, use reference, this and that. I mean, he just ripped it up. So I went back home and I went to the drawing board and I, I had photographs of everything taped up, you know, on the drawing board. And, you know, after about a year, uh, I could see the work was improving. And I tell young artists, you know, um, draw from life, draw from photographs, draw from reference. Don't worry about a style right now, you know, when you're starting out. Draw from reference and your spin on that will come through, especially when you're not intentionally trying to do it. Um, Mike understands this, too. Uh, uh, in the martial arts, when when you're performing a kata, it's not really that you're performing a kata if you're doing it right. The kata is performing you. You're just a vehicle for that energy that's happening. And in an ideal place, when you're drawing, it's the same thing. You're not even thinking, I got to put a line here. I got to put a line here. It's not a mechanical thing. At least it's not for me. I just have to zone out and uh, it comes to life, you know. And, you know, it's not going to be perfectly what I see in my head, but pretty close you know i'm seeing it here first i'm not really constructing and recording you know not every artist works that way yeah do you 
you have any advice for uh, artists that are trying to uh, get used to drawing like facial expressions and things <laughs> like that? Yeah, use a mirror. Uh, I, I used to have a mirror right by my table and, you know, make the face and, and, and draw it. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it's it, go from a uh, draw from life, reference it, um, vary your page. I would say also like, you know, medium shots, close ups, far away shots, you know, have those, have a variation of those on, on every page if you can. And uh, if you're going to do a close up, take the time to structure the face. You know, if it's going to be a grimace, you do it right. It's going to be a smile. It's going to be a frown, you know, um, and pay attention to eyes, hands and eyes can tell so much. Um, you know, Bern Hogarth wrote a whole book about hands, just yeah. hands, just hands. Um, you know, gestures, there's a, there's a level of theatrical gesturing that goes on in comic books that really helps not only communicate whatever <laughs> the emotions are that you're trying to get across, but also it can lead you to the next panel. Um, and, and it, you know, one, one of my favorite things to do was give the characters when they're in their street clothes and it's not a, you know, spandex fight scene or so or something like that i like giving my characters business to do right so they're pouring themselves a glass of wine or they're smoking or they're yes smoking i know it's not politically correct <gasps> gosh right i mean wolverine should be smoking i mean come on we love um, cigarettes in the comics and the movies because they're so visual. You may not be able to smoke in real life, but by God, you can smoke in the movies and in comics. So good. I mean, just, I mean, just using right the the yes. uh, the smoke yeah. trails, the, the smoke, yeah, the hand the hand gestures. You know, a slight gesture this way, or you know, this way, or what. I mean, th there's so much acting involved with the characters and blocking that helps. Yeah, uh, it's tremendous to have. But anyway, uh, smoking, uh, having a sip of wine or a beverage, anything. Um, but also, um, you know, preparing food like a kitchen is a great place for the characters to have a conversation off off the fighting arena. You know, where, where you know, where, what's going to happen? You know, did, did they find any evidence at the crime scene? You know, I don't know. And the guys, you know, chopping up the meat or whatever. And so, you know, give give the character something to do in the background. There's nothing worse than, you know, having them just standing upright and just delivering yeah. lines. But you know what I mean? Yeah. It also gives the artist that really nice uh, camera setup. You can do it over the shoulder. You can do, you know, side view. So, you know, there's just, you got to think of it cinematically to really make it come to life for me. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell a lot of writers, um, especially if they're if they're doing a lot of that where people where the characters are just sitting there, or standing there talking. I'll be like, have them walk and talk. Have them <laughs> yeah. do something or go somewhere or like you yeah. said, you know, drinking like whatever. Like because yeah. it just it just adds energy and life to it. That, of course, I mean everybody's know. gonna eat or snack or you know in in the back in the day, you know, smoke right. a cigarette, have a drink. You know, um, those that that makes for a lot more interesting scene uh, and the fight scenes as well. You know, give them something. You know, there's nothing worse than uh, there's convention in some script writers now where they'll uh, for the big two, especially they're so absorbed with dialogue. And I'm not against dialogue. Dialogue's everything. Yeah. But the Don't fights will started. literally be dialogue splattered around a feature shot of yeah. like Spider-Man in a pose. Right? right. Right. And you'll just see a couple of shots, maybe little bitty silhouettes of the fight scene. And then it's over. And then we're back to talking. It's like, no, 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 no. This is, this is action adventure, superhero stuff. You know, it's like, have the fight do something, have it be in an interesting place, have it take you from one room to the next. Uh, one of my favorite and show fights. show real techniques that are are innovative and exciting because you can use a fight scene to characterize your characters. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite. I'll use a, a cinematic example. Um, the the John Wick fight scene, you know, where where 
where he's uh, followed the uh, the Russian gangsters, you know, into their club, and he's making his way toward the main gangster. He's going, and he's yeah. just using everything in the environment, right. yeah. you know, and he's yeah. running out of. He's actually running out of ammo in his clips, you know, and he's throwing it down. He's grabbing the bad guy's gun. He's shooting. I mean, and again, it it shows not only the jujitsu jujitsu that he's using because he'll tie somebody up and flip them and arm bar them on the ground and then shoot another oncoming guy and another oncoming guy and then take the guy out that he's got held down. You know, yeah. it's the practical nature of the action scene taking you somewhere. And I remember uh, laying out a scene that uh, Mike and I worked on for a pitch we did. And uh, it was uh, it was a Ronda Rousey move that was, uh, you know, like a scissor lock with the legs and take yeah. down and an arm bar. And it was so I much fun this. to draw the characters doing that rather than just, you know, old fashioned fisticuffs, you know, uh, yeah. I always like uh, using throws too. like uh, if, if a character is in a fight scene, I love having the bad guy inverted, right? So the, the feet are in the air. Yeah. So you're implying like a jujitsu throw or something or an Aikido throw, you know, I love, I love seeing that, you know, show some techniques. And then um, the other thing I like to do if, if, and this is one reason Mike and I worked well together was I like drawing martial arts superhero characters because you can really get into the details of stances and poses and kicks and punches. And you can even draw them practicing Kata, which is really really cool i love seeing that in comics uh i've seen it with uh i guess it was yeah it was an iron fist uh sequence where just he was just kind of zoned out and going through kata you know and in that place and again it reminds you okay i'm in that world you know and it's helpful to add atmosphere and while i'm on atmosphere <laughs> the other thing i love to do uh, and I got this mainly from uh, Ridley Scott, but he loves using textures in his scenes, everything from Blade Runner and Alien yeah. and Kingdom of Heaven, where everything's just stuff floating in the air. So yeah. I'm always using rain or ashes or smoke or sleet or debris, you know, or glass or fragments of something floating in the air i love that because it adds it just adds a level of texture to the drawing that gives it more interest and it gives yeah. it motion and so um that's something i also use as well and the other thing is lighting uh which uh, really scott is, is a master of lighting as well because that for if you go back and watch alien the very first one it's not, you know, it's not a huge budget, but it's all smoke and fog and lights and yeah. sirens. And, and, you know, it, he, he, he just masterfully told this story. And, and you're like, I'm literally just looking at, you know, the actress running through the same hallway with different smoke and lighting. And it's, right. you know, it's, it's the cinematography, but it's her acting. It's everything together. But I just remember a close up and seeing you know, sweat beads on her face and her hands as she's watching for the alien. And you've got a strobe light going and you've got fog machine rolling. the back. You know, I mean, that's, I try to capture that too. So. You know, uh, you mentioned Ridley Scott, who's one of my favorite directors too. Uh, but occasionally uh, he does something peculiar and questionable. And uh, I thought that the fight scenes in Gladiator were unusually truncated and difficult to follow. But then you watch Kingdom of Heaven, which I consider one of his best movies, and it's exactly the opposite, because so much of Kingdom of Heaven is about tactics, how they're going to defend the city. They shoot the arrows to see how far they can go. Then they run out into the ground and plant flags where they are, so they know where they are. And then the giant siege machines, how they take down the siege machines, it's all brilliant. I love movies about tactics, and that one is just so great. Uh, and I wonder what happened to Gladiator. Uh, that I just wonder why those scenes were so truncated. They didn't need to be. They didn't need to be. And I, I wonder whether it was the, the stunt coordinator, or how it was shot. 
I think, wasn't that the period of time when directors were using that uh, sort of sped up use of, they, they were accelerating. Yeah. I have to look. I have the film. Yeah, Probably. The film. And, and so they would speed up the action. And then uh, you thought, I was like, oh, come on, guys, just show us how the gladiators would fight, you know, a, a net or a trident or, you know, um, the I remember that. The in Spartacus. Yeah, I love that. I love that film as well. But uh, Gladiator is, is one of my favorites for the, the spectacle. But you're right, as far as just the visceral fight sequences uh, and the strategy of it, um, I really enjoyed Kingdom of Heaven. Um, and I think um, as far as uh, shootouts mixed with martial arts, I think uh, Chad Stahelski has done a tremendous job uh, with um, John Wick, but also with uh, Captain America 2, um, The Winter Soldier. I thought yeah. the action in that particular movie was excellent. I think that's Marvel's best movie. Um, I, I would I agree with you. Um, I thought that the first Iron Man um, achieved a tone, a tonal balance of yeah. humor and action um, that was so enjoyable, um, mainly because RDJ did a decent job making that character more likable. And I thought uh, Favreau did a nice job with that. But those two stand out for me, Iron Man 1 and Cap 2. Cap 2 probably edges it out just because of the action and, and the fact that I felt like they got Captain America right in that, in that movie. Because I've discussed this before on a, on a stream, but it's difficult for writers today to capture what I call Boy Scout characters, uh, Superman and Captain America being the yeah. two come to mind. They seem to either darken them too much or they mock them through yeah. the dialogue of other characters. And that's a shame because the iconic nature of Superman, for example, uh, I've always considered his primary superpower to be his ability to restrain himself and not just rule because it's that virtue of yeah. humility, right? That, you know, I'm basically a godlike being. I could just tell these poor fools what to do and just punish them if they didn't. Right. But instead he's a public servant. Right. Yeah. And he's, he is the boy scout that tries to do the right thing. Um, there's not enough of that. People have this sense of outdatedness with virtue and I think it's the opposite. We've we've never needed it more than now, uh, in my opinion. And you can write characters that are Boy Scouts, uh, and you can write them well. And I think um, that's an example. Cap Two is an example of that. Uh, his dialogue and his behavior in that film uh, show you everything you need to know about. You know, hey, there was a time when you know those virtues were admired. And uh, if you write them well, they can be admired again. You know, we have plenty of antiheroes. I was a, I was a teenager. I, I yeah. liked all the antiheroes too. I liked, you know, the man with no name and, uh, you know, Escape from New York and all that. I loved all that stuff. But I still, I, I really was drawn to if you had a Boy Scout character and he was well written. Um, the Cowboys, for example, uh, you know, uh, Gunsmoke. Um, uh, you're too probably too young for that, Jeff. But Mike, Mike, can I remember? I remember you know, Gunsmoke. Do you remember Gunsmoke? Right? Yeah, yeah. So the idea, right, of having you know High Noon, the character, the the guy who has been there, he's seen it, he's done it, and he knows that at some point you just got to take the bad guys out, right? And um, he's not necessarily taking a lot of pleasure in that, but he's doing what's necessary. Uh, I was really disappointed, for example, I'll use a current example. Everybody loves uh, Yellowstone, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and I like parts of what Taylor Sheridan is doing there in terms of showing the, the cowboy lifestyle and the, in terms of 
their respect for, you know, property rights and land and living in a, in a style that's close to the land and so on. But I was really excited before the show actually was released because I thought, it was going to be more like Gunsmoke. When I saw that Kevin Costner was cast, I was like, oh, dude, this is going to be awesome. He's going to be like the lone, you know, Gary Cooper cleaning up a corrupt town and, you know, that whole thing. Just a little bit of that. But I mean, he's just basically a gangster. I mean, it's just it's his family of gangsters versus another set of bad guy. And so, you know. Yeah bad guys versus bad guys but you know to each his own you know you can do that too and make it good but i was so hoping we'd have you know the the old-fashioned you know elliot ness and the untouchables kind of thing that's fun to me you know yeah i wonder did you see that they um i saw an ad and i don't know where or when it's going to be but there's some kind of like documentary series or something he's doing yeah on on uh, yellowstone and, yes. and yes. the original i, I yeah, I, I, in some ways, I think that might give you give us more more a, a of what you're more, talking about. Yeah, well, you know, hopefully, his, his fame is really that Gary Cooper esque character right. that they see him as, and even though he's been written more as a you know the head of a gang family who's going to do whatever they need to do to accomplish their goals, right? Um people like it because of his past roles, you know, it's arguably, uh, what, uh, dances with wolves, untouchable. Yeah. I, I have to mention a film he made very recently that very few people have seen. It's called let him go. And it co-stars yeah. Diane Lane and it's a masterpiece. It's a thriller set in the sixties and I can't recommend it too highly. That sounds great. Is it is it on one of the streaming platforms? Yes, it I is. took it out of the library. Okay. But you can find it on a streaming platform. Uh Costner and Lane are, are two ranchers in Montana whose son marries a young woman. They have a boy, and then the son is killed in a horse accident, and the woman remarries into this family of scumbags. And one day they're in town and they see her new husband first push the little boy who's five years old and then he pushes the mother and they realize they have to get him back and it's about how they go to this family's place way off the grid in north dakota and get him back oh it sounds sounds great um, also uh both you guys have seen treasure of the sierra madre right of course well yeah. there's a fight scene in there which is the opposite of every fight scene we've ever discussed but it's also probably the most realistic fight scene in a fictional movie that's ever been done it's the fight in the bar when they're trying to collect their wages from the guy who hired them you remember that yeah, yeah. and he hits them in the head with a bottle and they end up rolling on the ground yeah yeah i mean that just that's the yeah. way it is that's, that's the way it is yeah. yeah yeah and also uh the fatigue level you know after after a few punches and rolling around the ground the you know the fighters start getting tired so things get sloppy and you know that's nor that's real that's that's real and yeah i remember that and and i i recall in an interview uh before spielberg completely lost his mind um where he was asked about raiders of the lost ark and he said uh that he wanted the character of Indiana Jones to be reminiscent of that character in Treasure of the Sierra Madre. So, and in that first film, in Raiders, the introduction of Indiana Jones has a little bit of that flavor to it. Um, you know, you don't know who it is, and he steps into the light after whipping the, the pistol out of the guy's hand who's trying to get the jump on him. It's very, very cool. Uh, but yeah, that, I like that tone for a hero too. I think, uh, Indiana Jones fits into what I'm talking about where he does what's necessary, but I would say he's a boy scout as well. Um, in, in, I guess alignment, if we're going to use RPG language here, right? <laughs> what's your alignment? Oh, this awful, good, lawful, neutral, chaotic, good, you know, whatever. Well, speaking of that, you are involved with a role-playing game right now. I am indeed. Um, I was contacted uh, about illustrating a guidebook for an upcoming role-playing game 
called Light Raiders, um, which is uh, going to launch in the late spring of 23. And it's a faith-based game written by a gentleman named James Hannibal, who's written a, a lot of faith-based uh, fiction and material. You can check it out on online. It's a lot of fun because uh, it took me back to the days of, of being a kid and playing, you know, D&D when it first came out, staying up all night and throwing dice and, yeah. you know, making up silly adventures and having a good time. But it's, you know, I got to design a lot of the, the characters and the environments uh, and it's fun, you know, getting to draw high fantasy like that. It's a blast. So. Yeah. And it's a, it's a hot thing right now too. I mean, I mean, not just role playing games, but, but fantasy stuff in general is. Oh is, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. And it, we were talking about that. I'd love to get you guys to take on this. Um, and one of our streams uh, we were talking about with, with the advent of, you know, Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, making all this money. But it's rare you see epic fantasy comics do uh, yeah. as well. And we were talking about why is that? You know, and everybody had, had a theory. But uh, I would say it's the art style for, for me. I would I would say, I mean, if you had, you know, a really good like painter style artist yeah, uh, like that. I mean, because everybody tries to do it very comic booky. Yeah. And it just doesn't it doesn't work that great. Actually, there's one, um, although it's pretty dark, but there's one uh, that's done really well, at least financially and, and with the fans and everything uh, called Die. Um, and it's a D and it's a D and D type thing. And then this one one of the characters kind of he gets the their crew back together and he's gotten unbeknownst to them like he's it's almost like the D cartoon thing where he kind of takes them into this other world uh but it's very dark and because he's gotten into like real dark magic and stuff and okay. he's basically kind of trying to take them out and different things and so they're and do these other things and that are like really uh really pretty wild like i think he even has um i'm trying to remember exactly because i've only read a couple of them but he i think he even has like dice where his eyes were huh, okay and stuff it's like really there's some like really it's right. but it, it's cool because it's almost it gives you that vibe of a lot of the high fantasy where it's like it's really good against evil um sure. there, there's definitely some gray in there but right. it's like it's very it's very clear that like most of the evil stuff is very a gross and clearly evil and right. and they've really got this big you know uphill thing against them especially because most of them are regular people they're not they're not actually the characters that they played years ago or whatever and stuff right uh, but that the art style for that is it's kind of an in-between it's kind of a hybrid where there's some it's more of a simple um painted style kind of okay um okay. And as I said, that has gone over very well. A lot of the other things have not like lasted that long. Um, that one, I think, has around 50 issues or or, or something. Oh, okay. That's I mean, it's correct. actually sold really, really well. Um, and it has some really good, um, since I, not that you have to talk about this, but it has some really good uh, graphic design elements and stuff to oh, it, yeah. too. Um, yeah. Because it actually, you know, like the uh, sides on like a 20-sided die, how it's the, all the different interconnected triangles, they do that with the covers for it. So there's oh. like spaces out of where the triangles are and they put the things in there. So it's very heavily thematic and everything. And um, it, it, But is it, it, is it die cut? I it's I don't I they, I would not be surprised if they did not have some <laughs> sort of die cut version. Probably. Yeah, but I, but yeah, but there definitely needs to be. There needs there to needs be. To be. You know, Cross Gen yeah. did a title, uh, Sojourn. Yeah, was it did really well. Pretty decent, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that had a real uh, Lord of the Rings look because it followed the film. It it came out right after Jackson's trilogy uh, movies right. were done. So, uh, but yeah, the. The epic fantasy material is really fun to to draw and it does i still draw in my in my style but he obviously the creator wanted that he's like no we we want you to draw like you draw right and, uh even though you're drawing you know sword sword and sorcery stuff which brings me to like a lot of inspiration from conan you know because conan's lasted a long time and yeah. you could argue that's a type of epic fantasy it's not you know elves and orcs but then again 
it's got swords and sandals, man. Yeah. You know? And um, again, though, that that is a different kind of thing. Somebody mentioned uh, that uh, Sandman was fantasy and it's done. Well, I was like, well, yeah, kind of. Kind not of, really the epic quest fantasy that I'm thinking of in my yeah. head, but you could argue that. I think uh, Barb brought up uh, Elf Quest. Yeah. Another one, right? So yeah. there have been some attempts out there. Um, the other one that you don't see doing really well is um, like Halo or Call of Duty, right? You've know, got these video games going gangbusters yeah. with, with, you know, making tons of money. But where are the military, you know, comic books? And I looked it up, actually, and Activision actually uh, put out uh, Call of Duty. Comic, yep. Pretty high quality. Um, yeah. But I think I think a lot of that has to do with the gaming experience is so real right. now that yeah. it's almost like, why do the comic when you can do the game? But then again, um, Mike can speak to this better than I can. The fact that, you know... The Punisher was so successful for so long as yeah. well. Um, it's interesting. Are they Are they still, I mean, they're still doing The Punisher now. I know he's appearing in other books. It has become an embarrassment to Marvel. Oh. And uh, they've turned him into a ninja. They've taken away yeah. the skull. Oh. Um, the creator of The Punisher has declared he's ashamed that military and police use the symbol. Oh, and uh, it seems like they're getting ready to finish him off. Finish him off. I think, yeah. yeah, I, you know, one of the, one of the mainstream titles that I do follow because I like the art is Daredevil. And in the current Daredevil, yeah. they've made the Punisher the head of yep. the hand. And, yeah. uh, yeah, Daredevil and Elektra are the head of the fist, and though they're going up against each other, I'm wondering if they're setting him up to be whacked in this particular story. I don't know, but uh, I it's... have to confess, I haven't read a Punisher comic in years. The only news I get from them is on the uh, Facebook Punisher forums, yeah. which follow the character religiously. Right. Yeah. Um, I. I mean. You know, John Wick, you know, if, if the Punisher's so bad, then yeah, yeah. Why is John Wick okay, right? But I guess because, Marvel wouldn't publish that. because he fights fantasy villains. Well, uh, he, he also, he also, I mean, they killed his dog, so true. I, I, I explained that to my wife. I'm like, yeah, you got to watch this with me. And she's like, what, what? <laughs> shoot him up. I said, I know you, you like spy movies. This is a little more of a, you know, but you'll like this. Once we got past the dog scene, she was right there with him, and she was like, you know, "Oh yeah, take him out." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like the emotional the... engine of that just yeah. really carries you. Through. Oh yeah, and I like the uh, and I and I've told a lot of people too. It has some of the better world building in yeah. a in, in 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 an action movie. I mean, with the whole hotel thing and everything. Oh, I'm actually yeah. I'm actually interested to to because they're still talking about doing the TV show or whatever. Uh, around the hotel and everything, and I'm 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 pretty interested. To I, I think that's a cool. There's a lot of neat stuff you could do with they that. They lost me with the last one. The last yeah. one was a little the yeah. high table. Yeah. Uh, Dean, tell us about Cat and Mouse. Cat and Mouse. Um, we got started with that in in 2016, and um, we wanted to bring it up to date. Uh, Roland's original idea was that these uh, teenagers. Uh, one had run away from home and um, he was kind of a sort of a goth girl rejecting parental authority and stuff. She runs off to New Orleans and um, her sister's ex-boyfriend decides to go chase her down. And he's had some training in law enforcement. He goes down there to find her and they end up uncovering a human trafficking group down there uh, led by this female villain and i suggested to roland i said let's make this even a little bit cooler since we're in new orleans let's bring some voodoo and some some dark magic into it so i kind of took a page out of live and let die and i styled a lot of 
the villainous trappings uh, along the lines of solitaire and live and let die and also put a few of the voodoo image images from that film around the atmosphere and we kind of tried to turn it into a little bit of a scary thing but it was fun because uh it basically ends up being you know teen titans fighting a, um, a voodoo cult that kidnaps kids and, and rescuing them it it got to be a lot of fun so i I did the first one and got into the second one. And then um, I had to move on to other things. As Mike knows, when you get to be our age, parents start to get ill and they need more care. And so that happened. And I'm being the only kid. I had that on my shoulder. So I had to take a break from comics for a while, take care of family business. Once that was done, I got back into it again. But this time I talked to Roland about silver blade and that's currently the the book i'm in development in now and what i wanted to do originally was i wanted to do my take on dracula from van helsing's point of view and i created this order of knights uh the order of sacred silver um that existed as a spinoff from the templars and they know the secret of why silver defeats evil i wanted to tell that story so it grew from that basic concept to its own thing where I put Dracula out of it. Van Helsing's still in it, but it's more about the order fighting uh, a cult of the golden calf, which I call the golden legion. And so you got silver versus gold, right? In essence, and you've got these, this order of knights in Victorian London, this American cavalry officer, who had his wife killed and his daughter kidnapped goes over to England because of some leads he finds and ends up uh, using his skills as a swordsman to uh, do a demonstration of fencing with the English champion. He beats the English champion and uh, one of the knights of the order is there watching him and contacts him after and says, hey, look, you've got a skill set we need. We're getting pretty old to keep doing this stuff. We always need new recruits. Ask him to join. He says, now nah, you know, your little club with your knights or whatever. I'm not into that. And he's, he's a man of the world. He has no faith. He has, he's just, you know, he's broken. Um, through the experience of the storyline, however, he does become involved with the knights eventually, and he does get his faith renewed. And we go along the adventure with him and we uncover sort of a hellfire club type of cult in underground London. And it's set in 1892. So if you've ever played anything like Assassin's Creed Syndicate, if you're aware of that environment, um, that's kind of the idea there. Um, so I wanted to blend. So you have some characters from literature that you're going to recognize, like Alan Quartermain. Um, my leading character was trained by Zorro who in my storyline is also a member of the Order of Sacred Silver, right? So it's kind of this brotherhood of good guys that's been behind the scenes for years. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the setup for it. So I'm going to be working on that the, the, through throughout 2023 and try to get that launched. Um, and then whatever comes next, I know Mike and I were did you ever hear back from uh, that gentleman who, who had talked to you about doing a, possibly doing a storyline about, yeah, it's a place on the border. It was similar to your private American book. I wondered if that ever manifested. You mean Nick Searcy? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, we're talking and uh, Nick is a great guy. He's very, been very helpful to me. Yeah. You know, he's a well-known actor. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but right now, he gave us permission to use his likeness in a graphic novel. We're adapting John Ringo's uh, zombie apocalypse novels into graphic novels, and Nick's going to be a bad guy. But I would love to hear his uh, idea for a border story. In fact, I'm going to ask him to send it to me. Good, good. Um, because as I said, I, that would be something fun and exciting to do too. Um, would you be interested in illustrating that? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Well, I'll keep that in mind. Please. Yes, please do. Um, I, um, uh, I like stories where 
you have a clear definition of, of good and evil. Um, Absolutely. Me too. Ba- I like where the bad talk guys about that all the time. are bad and the good guys are good. And it doesn't have to be in a cheesy way or, or no, it doesn't. childlike. No, it all depends. It's not what you say. It's the way that you say it. The way that yeah. you say it. Yes. You know, in fact, John I, Gardner wrote a book called On More. Uh, he kind of, he kind of. He's cycling, I think. The is probably lots of noise with the dogs or got it. Got wife it. Wife or that's okay. Garage door opener. The the. But uh, in on moral fiction, Gardner argues that the audience wants to see good rewarded and evil punished, or they will feel cheated. And Correct. I agree with that for the most part. Uh, uh, we want our stories to have a moral epiphany, and that doesn't mean that the uh, hero always prevails. Uh, just look at the end of Spartacus, where he's hanging on the cross. Yeah. The grace yeah. note is when his wife rides by in the cart and holds his child up. He says, see, you live on. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I've always thought that, in fact, um, I illustrated a book cover last year for um, a novel called Quo Vadis. And if you've ever read that, Mike, um, uh, it's fantastic. Some, some say that the movie Gladiator is loosely adapted from Quo Vadis, and there are so many em- elements that are similar. Has that book been published? Yes, it has. Do you yeah. have copies? I have copies. Would you like Let's trade books. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. it, it's an excellent, excellent novel set in that time period of ancient Rome during the reign of Emperor Nero. And it, it holds back nothing when it comes to what was done to Christians at that time for the entertainment of uh, people in the arena. And it's horrifying. And um, the the storyline is excellent. I don't want to give any of it away, but it's an excellent novel. Um, but that being said, I, I really think that part of the reason these films do well and, and are enduring movies like Gladiator, um, even like Braveheart, um, is because they tell stories of men with conviction and with a value system that they refuse to compromise and they pay the price for it. Um, and yet, uh, as Mike stated earlier, you know, evil is punished and good is rewarded. And that resonates uh, beyond America. It resonates worldwide. It resonates on a human level. And those stories, to me, have a better chance of becoming what we would call modern mythology. And, uh, and in fact, to me, that is elevated to the level of literature. I know that according to academia, you know, one has to produce something of political significance in order for it to be cons- considered literature these days. But to me, it has to have a more epic scope, a more universal conflict. Uh, and if it's if it's written and illustrated well, or or the story is told on a level of excellence, then it will endure. Yeah, and I well, and I, I was just gonna say I think that's the goal for um, a lot of um, creators, even though they don't know it. So especially when they're younger, they don't necessarily know it. But I think when you get older, you're like, okay, these certain movies or these certain books or whatever, like they like really had a heavy influence on me. Like they made me rethink something or whatever. And it's like, it's like, yeah, I mean, you can literally change people's lives or inspire them in other ways um by by those stories absolutely um and they don't have to be particularly preachy either Uh, they're they're folks who may not know that the chronicles of narnia by c.s lewis is is a christian metaphor i mean right for those of us raised in that faith it's obvious it's right there but you know for some people that they they're getting the message through fantasy through epic fantasy and yet it's still a wonderfully entertaining tale uh the first book especially the line the witch in the War- wardrobe excellent book for kids but for everyone i think uh, yeah 
Yeah, I, I actually like, um, which is, I don't know, it's a weird thing for me. I like it when it's the reverse. I like Magician's Nephew when, ever, when like the witch and things come to our world. Yeah. And, and, and I, I love stories like that where the where the crazy thing or like, you know, like Ham, the Weather Wizard comes to our world. And <laughs> right, right. No, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I've talked to people who are on both sides of that, the production yeah. order and the chronological order of people, you know. And yeah, uh, yeah I respect both of those positions. I'm more the production order person. Right. You know, the reason yeah. it was written first. And yeah. uh, I like I like the metaphor there. And I, I think. I think that as as a as a creator who has a strong faith, I feel I'm I'm called to share redemption stories, and uh, some of them can be obvious and some of them can be metaphorical. But that's the story I'm compelled to tell. That's what I'm here to do. Yeah. Uh, so you'll see that theme in a lot of the stories that that I write and have creative input in, for sure. Well, that's the basic theme of most of the stories we like yeah 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 even <laughs> i was gonna say even like the the original the original like star wars trilogy and stuff that they that even george lucas has gone back and tried to kind of un undo some of the uh the, the stuff because he doesn't like the way it comes across he, now he but make it all go away by producing an outstanding new movie that's all it takes is an outstanding new movie yeah but they can't you know I, retroactively you know, <laughs> and, and we've been watching these movies i mean we've all seen some of the subsequent star wars movies and yeah, some of them are entertaining but they just don't have the impact they just don't they don't uh four five and six as i call it you know or, or i even like better calling just star wars empire and jedi right that's yeah, all yeah i mean the, those are the other movies are fun and i i kind of like some of the themes but overall the impact of the original trilogy uh still reigns supreme in my mind and um you know the the lessons uh people still connect with empire because of the introduction of yoda and the lessons of basically growing up and learning to go from childhood to manhood and what what that means and what you're responsible for and luke refusing to use anger to take down his father right yeah yeah that is an old japanese samurai legend right. where the samurai is chasing someone down a criminal and he's, it's taken him for almost, you know, years. And he finally gets him cornered. And the the uh, criminal in his anger spits on the samurai. And the samurai gets so mad. And he reaches to draw his sword. And he doesn't draw it. And he waits for another time. Yeah. Because he doesn't want to take him out in anger. Right? The anger would be taking him down, not, not justice. Right? So... Those, those old lessons and old myths are all there to teach us something about vengeance versus justice and, and these, these higher callings, these higher virtues. Uh, virtue is everything. I mean, isn't it Socrates that said that life should be the cultivation of virtue, basically, to live a good life? Why aren't they teaching that in school? Or are they too busy teaching other things? <laughs> we could go there. We could do a whole show on that. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there since we're at an hour so yeah yeah oh i had something to add to that, that you I got to. Oh, oh okay 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 no i was just gonna say um because of what you brought up earlier with uh with like the self-restraint i i think self-control and self-restraint we need some kind of fantastic story about that or or some kind of concept that really can kind of drive that home because it, I mean, just right. like that is just not in our society. Well, they used to call it at all. It was called yeah. temperance. But... Well, I think it's all over classic literature. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's just and even I mean, modern literature to a certain extent. There are people that repeat those those lessons, right? Those life lessons. And yeah. People use the wrong word all the time. Trope. Now that's like the new yeah. word. Yeah. Um, they think it means cliche. It's, it's not that they use it interchangeably. It doesn't mean that. But 
yeah. what what we need to do is return if you want to tell epic enduring stories in my opinion is return to telling stories about these virtues you know yeah. the seven virtues and uh, because those are the struggles of all of us. That's a common struggle of being human. Um, you know, subduing your wrath, uh, subduing your desire. Um, the, the icon of St. George and the dragon, if you look at it carefully, um, St. George isn't slaying the dragon. St. George is subduing the dragon. And uh, many scholars say that that is an example of the idea that we can't completely defeat our dark side, but right. the struggle of life is to subdue it. It makes us who we are. Uh, there was a Star Trek, the original series episode called The Enemy Within that addressed that, for those of you who remember the yeah. original series. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Kirk could only be Kirk if he had the dark side within him, but it needed to be managed and the balance of of that was what makes us a complete human being you can't completely purge the darkness but you can subdue it so yeah i, I would agree with you stories like that would be quite helpful for our yeah culture. yeah well and that's what i'm saying i'm saying more like in a pop culture comic mm -hmm. book, movie tv show like whatever but you could okay. even set it as like a sci-fi yeah uh, like actually one of the things and I'm not, I'm not trying to drag on Mike, I promise. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's Mike's going to sleep. Um, <laughs> there he's nodding off. One, one of the things that I, that I, uh, loved, um, about the show Pushing Daisies is that the two people that are in love can never touch because, if he touches, he can, he can touch people once and bring them back to life. If he touches something again, it, it's dead again. And so he brings back the, the his his girlfriend that was murdered that he's in love with, but he can never touch her again. But he's always close to her, and like that that's one of the better self restraint things yeah. because it's like I can always be with her, but I can never touch her. And it's like, and it just the 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 real love that like of their relationship that comes across from that is like. I mean, so many people, especially females, but a lot of people in general, like that is one of the most romantic shows because mm -hmm. it's just they really have to just love each other <laughs> and and never touch or else she's dead. Yeah. But uh, and and there, there's some there's some interesting twists or whatever you could do with something like that that would kind of kind of give a restraint um, message. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's a good one. Mike, Mike is thinking of taking your man card away for bringing. Yeah, you. I know. I know. <laughs> I don't care. It's, no, it's if it's good, it's good, he's, right? That's okay. Yeah. He's I I took his permission to get in Florida away, so it's it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you would be a perfect fit for Florida, dude. I mean, uh, that's uh, actually really true. <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, my, why isn't Mike in Florida or Texas? That's what I've I'm, been there many times, but but Jeff's going to be in the next book. Uh -huh. Oh boy! See, excellent. I keep, be interesting. Yeah, I keep. Well, I keep teasing him, but and I and actually, it does surprisingly it sells very well in Florida. Um, his silly Florida man book, but uh, well, of course it does. It's fun, but it is very, it is very funny, and it is. Very I'll send fun. you those, Dean. Thank you. Yeah, please yeah. do. I write myself a note to send you a Quo Vadis. You'll love it. Quo Where will you send it? I'll send it to That's your, just a play on words. Ah, uh, see, his cleverness knows no bounds. I know. He knows bounds. He knows bounds. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate you guys. Enjoyed it. See Thank you. Around. Okay, bye.